Okay, um, why don't we get started? Good afternoon and welcome everyone. This is Jim Rooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and on behalf of the entire chamber team, uh, we hope that you, your families, loved ones, work colleagues, are uh, all safe and healthy um, in, this, uh, in this crisis moment that we're experiencing together. Uh, as we all continue to adapt to this unprecedented time, uh, the team at the chamber is committed to serving not only as the voice of our region's business community, uh, but as a source of information and a connector uh, to people who are uh, dealing with this crisis on the front lines, whether those are public health officials uh, who are dealing with uh, that dimension of the crisis, or people that are dealing with the uh, significant economic fallout that uh, this public health crisis has called, uh, caused. And today's call is no exception. Uh, as the news about COVID-19 continues to evolve, we're here today to hear from Eric Rosengren, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, before I introduce Eric, I wanna start with a few notes including a big thank you to today's sponsor, Hinkley Allen, a partner of the chamber and bringing relevant content to our community. Uh, we're extremely appreciative of our continued partnership with Hinkley Allen and thank you for all that you're doing in this moment. I also want to flag for those on this webinar that it is being recorded and will be shared on Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. Finally, please uh, be sure to submit your questions. Uh, you can do that throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature. Uh, make sure to send to all panelists um, when you do ask a question. For those that are listening uh, by phone, you can email us questions at chamber programs with an S, chamber programs, all one word, at bostonchamber.com. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our special guest. Eric Rosengren is the 13th president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, one of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. After serving in various roles and positions at the bank, Eric was appointed as president in 2007. So this, in this role, Eric leads the Boston Fed's work in a variety of ways, including economic research and analysis, banking supervision, and financial stability efforts, and a wide range of payments, technology, and finance initiatives. Uh, Eric has, um, has uh, presented to a chamber audience several times before, uh, and each time offers a wealth of experience, knowledge, and perspective and I'm very grateful that Eric could join us here today. Um, thank you, Eric. We have about 700 uh, people waiting to hear from you, not me, so I'll turn it over uh, to you. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you to uh, the staff and everybody at the Boston Chamber for hosting this event. I very much look forward to the opportunity to meet with people in person at some future event, but uh, obviously with the pandemic, it's gonna be some time before we're back meeting together in uh, large meeting forums. Uh, I would also highlight that the slides that you're gonna be seeing as part of this presentation are also on the Boston Feb website, uh, which you can download and print out, and that we also have a, a short uh, written text to go with it as well. If you turn to slide two, uh, just to give an overview of my remarks, after a fairly brief introduction, I'm going to talk primarily about the steps that the Federal Reserve is taking to try to mitigate some of the problems that have been generated by the pandemic. I'm then going to talk about some of the other steps that can be taken by other branches of government or other organizations. I'll quickly assess the economic outlook and then do some concluding observations, which will hopefully leave us plenty of time for Q&A. Turning to slide three. Um, this pandemic is very different in terms of its effect on the economy than most other kinds of economic shocks that we encounter. I think what's particularly important right now is both the scope and duration of this 
uh, economic problem is integrally tied to how quickly we're able to uh, to address the problem um, with the pandemic itself. So the more successful we are at being able to shelter at home, the more successful Please. we are at being able to somebody mute. I think there's uh, getting a lot of interference. Great. Um, the, the, the more quickly we're able to get the virus to be playing less of a role, doing things like uh, making sure that we are able to be tested, getting to the point where community transmission is not occurring. Those are really the main factors that are going to drive how quickly the economy recovers. But I think there are important roles for all elements of government and business beyond what the medical professionals and public health officials are going to be doing. I would highlight that the fiscal policy, Congress has just recently had uh, legislation that is hopefully going to help support both businesses and individuals. And state and local government obviously have a critical role in making sure that the transmission of the virus is mitigated uh, to the extent possible. So what's the role for the Federal Reserve? Well, I would highlight one of the main roles for the Federal Reserve is to mitigate the financial spillovers caused by uh, the pandemic. So we can't do anything about the infection rate or how that's affecting our communities. But what we can do is try to prevent what is primarily a public health issue from also becoming a very significant financial and economic issue. And so those are the issues that I think the central bank is best able to address. And we're making some progress, I think, already, even though it's really early on in the activities of the Federal Reserve to, to, to try address those issues. So turning to uh, page four, uh, the first steps that the Federal Reserve took was we cut short-term interest rates. And we reduced interest rates by one and a half percent. In terms of the, what the Federal Reserve normally does, uh, we normally move in a quarter of a percent maybe every six weeks. If we do that for consecutive six-week periods, that actually is a very quick movement in monetary policy. This time at two emergency meetings at the beginning of March, uh, we reduced by one and a half percent. Now, when we reduce interest rates, uh, it's not just the federal funds rate, the short term interest rate that the Federal Reserve directly impacts, but it's the broader set of interest rates that become very important to go down by the same amount, because that's how monetary policy transmits to firms and how monetary policy transmits to individuals. However, as a result of some of the things going on in financial markets, to date, that financial plumbing hasn't worked as effectively. So if you turn to slide five, you'll see in the first figure that we did uh, two very substantial cuts. And now for all practical purposes, the interest rate that the Federal Reserve um, controls is between zero and 25 basis points. So for all practical purposes, uh, short-term interest rates are at zero. So there's not much more that the Federal Reserve can do with short-term interest rates. But if this lower interest rates don't flow through to the rest of the economy, it's not going to be very effective monetary policy. So a number of the actions the Federal Reserve has taken are trying to make sure that individuals that want to get to be able to refinance or to buy a car or businesses that need financing are able to share in the benefits of lower interest rates. If you turn to slide six, um, the first area, and this was quite a surprise to me, was how quickly even the Treasury securities market became overwhelmed. And the reason it became overwhelmed is normally investors, when they want to reduce risk, move into Treasury securities. But Treasury securities were one of the few securities that had lost value. And as individuals and firms became more concerned about how extensive the pandemic was going to be and how it was going to affect the economy, uh, both individuals and firms started selling treasury securities. Unfortunately, there really wasn't anybody on the other side of that. Now, the treasury securities market 
is a critical market. It's not only important because the treasury market finances government debt, but it's also used as a hedge against many other financial instruments. And in many respects, the treasury market is the cornerstone not only of the US financial system, but the global financial system. So when individuals and firms are unable to trade in treasury securities, it is very, very disruptive. So when there were lots of sellers and nobody on the buy side, that created a real problem. We were seeing very few trades and a lot of volatility. Uh, a second problem that was occurring was in the mortgage market. Again, this is a market that tends, like the treasury securities market, to be very large. There are lots of transactions. It tends to be liquid. So that if you want to trade in mortgage-backed securities, you normally can do that quite easily. Just like in the treasury market, many investors were seeking to sell their mortgage-backed securities, get more liquid, have more cash. Again, there was nobody on the other side of this trade. So that meant that not only did longer-term treasury rates not fully reflect the lower rates that the Fed had set, but it also didn't get reflected to the full extent in mortgage rates either. Turning to slide seven. So what are the steps that were taken here? Well, when there are a lot of sellers and nobody buying, uh, the one organization that has a balance sheet that can serve on the other side of this transaction is the Federal Reserve. So, so the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has been buying hundreds of billions of dollars of both treasury and mortgage-backed securities. The purpose of this is to stabilize the market. So it's a little bit different than our typical quantitative easing where we're just trying to lower longer term interest rates or mortgage rates. We're trying to do that in this case as well, but it's in part to make sure that the market's functioning in a more effective way. So we want to get these markets to the point that you can trade in fairly large volumes without causing the price to move very significantly. And so when people buy these securities, they're not as worried about whether or not they can get out of the position um, at some point in the future. Now, it's incredibly important for the mortgage market to be stabilized, in part because one of the ways that monetary policy works is when we lower short-term rates, we want to lower long-term rates. And one of the first things for many homeowners that can save them a lot of money is the ability to refinance. So we want to make sure that the ability to refinance, and if you're looking for a new home, have the ability to uh, get a, a first-time mortgage or a, a mortgage after you've sold your house. Um, we need to have the interest rate reduction that we did with the federal funds rate transmit into the mortgage market. So we're starting to get some progress there. I would say in the treasury market, uh, it is now much easier to trade in volume. I would say the mortgage uh, market is coming back somewhat, but we still have more work to do. Uh, there are a number of players in the mortgage market that are still quite stressed. Some of those are institutions that do a lot of hedging. And because the hedges are moving very quickly in terms of price, uh, it's very difficult for them to be able to lock into interest rates. So usually when you take out a home mortgage, you want to lock until the time that you close. That's become very difficult because the hedging strategies are very difficult to do in markets where the price is moving around very rapidly. Turning to slide eight. Uh, so it's not just the government and mortgage market that have been disrupted. So in many respects, uh, other markets have also encountered very significant problems. One of the areas that we've focused a lot of attention on is money market funds. There's a section of money market funds that really have not encountered any problems and have in fact seen inflows. And those are money market funds that only invest in government securities. So that area of the market, which is the largest part of the money market fund market, actually has been improving. A second area is the prime money market funds. They buy high quality paper firms, for example, with commercial paper. They buy large bank certificates of deposits, and they buy other secured products like uh, commercial paper that is asset backed, which means that when you're buying a car, when you're buying um, credit card and using your credit card to buy things, 
many of those receivables are sold into a product and those products tend to be asset backed commercial paper so it's really important for that market to be functioning as well but unfortunately even though these tend to be uh, very high quality credits those assets were very difficult to trade there were very few occurring same reason as for the mortgage and treasury market people were trying to move to cash and so it was very difficult to transact and even some of the highest rated debt of some of our highest rated companies. So as a result, there was a danger that money market funds faced with uh, individuals wanting to get more liquid and institutions wanting to get more liquid would have a difficult time getting that liquidity and might potentially cause uh, prime funds to either gate their funds or close their funds. Similarly, money market funds that are tied to municipal securities these tend to be tax exempt while there's a little bit of an institutional market here it's probably uh, primarily to retail individuals that buy these kind of money market funds uh, municipal securities also stop being traded even for short-term funding of very highly rated municipality securities so if that continued there would be a concern that people that had invested in what they thought was a high quality short-term tax advantaged instrument wouldn't be able to easily get their funds out. So that was very challenging for this high quality market to in effect not be working effectively as so many people were moving to the cash market. So turning to slide nine. This just shows you a graph of the, the first two types of money market funds that I was talking about. So in the dark blue line, you see the, the money market funds that only invest in government securities. That's the larger part of the market. And you can see since the middle of March, that blue line has gone up quite dramatically. Looking at the green line, those are the prime funds. So the prime funds are the funds that are investing in these high quality assets. And you can see that as individuals and institutions wanted to get into cash, they were selling out of their prime money market funds. And you can see that there was a very significant uh, decline in prime money market funds. Turning to slide 10. Um, one of the assets that uh, many of the prime money market funds held was asset backed commercial paper. As I mentioned before, this is short-term debt that's used to finance everything from car loans to student loans to credit card receivables. Uh, normally, you can see in the February time period that they tend to trade at a rate very, very low relative to the federal funds rate. So it tends to track the federal funds rate, which is the rate that the Federal Reserve sets very closely. But you can see in the middle of March, that the asset backed commercial paper rates went up very dramatically. Uh, in the last uh, couple of days, that spread has come down. So we're seeing some of the short term markets that are really important to be financing loans to individuals is actually starting to stabilize a little bit. Turning to slide 11. So one of the reasons for the improvement in this market and why at the very end, uh, the last two days, you saw that the uh, withdrawals from the prime funds had slowed down is the Boston Reserve Bank is running a facility. It's a facility that the Board of Governors authorized us to set up that provides the ability of money market funds to sell high rated assets to banks and we provide them a loan to finance that purpose of this is to provide funds to these money market funds so they are able to provide uh, cash should, should somebody want to liquidate their position in the prime fund. It has a secondary goal of trying to uh, improve the trading in short-term high quality assets. So it's really important both for the competence of investors, but it's also very important for the ability of individuals, companies, and local governments to be able to get short-term financing. So as of last Thursday, we had purchased roughly $30 billion of these short-term assets. We've continued over the last week to purchase more of these, and we are starting to see some improvement in these markets. 
There are a number of other facilities that are in the planning stage or are soon to be rolled out. Those are being run by the New York Federal Reserve. Uh, those include facilities that are focused on uh, short-term high-quality paper, the commercial paper market, as well as longer-term securities. has the same general goal. We want to make sure that firms are able to finance themselves with short-term debt, and we want to make sure that that market is able to work in an effective way. Turning to slide 12. Uh, the further you get out, both in uh, credit risk and in maturity, uh, the more difficult it is to trade in large transactions. So an area that normally doesn't face that many difficulties is the high-rated corporate debt market. So it's like uh, the short-term debt market, but it's for a longer time period. So asking people to lock up their funds for a longer time period means that if interest rates change much, you're going to see a significant movement in the price of that underlying asset. So even in this market, we've seen many firms finding it very difficult to issue debt into the market. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, these are firms that are our highest rated firms, and yet they're unable to easily be able to transact. We've seen some improvement in this market over the last week, um, but nonetheless, it's at uh, interest rate spreads, which you'll see in a minute, that still remain quite elevated uh, relative to what we normally see. So the problem was not much trading. You couldn't issue large amounts and expect that there would be plenty of buyers on the other side. That means that some of the lower interest rates that the Federal Reserve did didn't pass through to even some of our largest, most creditworthy firms. So the steps taken in this area are the New York Fed is establishing two facilities. One is so that firms can directly issue long-term debt and the second is to improve secondary market trading of corporate bonds. So the purpose again is to make sure that these corporations have the financing they need. Hopefully that will discourage them from laying off as many workers because they can count on getting uh, the kind of financing they need to operate their business and particularly to bridge their business over the next couple of months where social distancing may substantially cut back on the amount of revenue that they're going to be getting. Turn to slide 13. So this just shows you the spread between high rated corporate bonds and a five year treasury rate. As you can see, there tends to be a fairly narrow spread if you go back to February. As we got again into the middle of March, that spread widened out very significantly. We've seen some improvement, but we're still not back to the kind of spreads that we were seeing prior to uh, the concerns about the pandemic uh, becoming very elevated. So some improvement in this market, uh, though we have more room to go. Slide 14, please. So um, the Fed and other supervisors have been taking actions beyond just what we're doing in the financial markets. And one of those areas is uh, making sure that bank lending continues to occur. So there have been a number of things that we've done, and I'm not going to go through all the specifics, uh, people that are interested in more of the specifics can look at the Board of Governors website to see the various actions they've taken to try to encourage banks to be able to lend uh, more easily. But we've reduced some of the liquidity and capital requirements and allowed banks to uh, use some of their buffers in order to provide them more flexibility to do lending. We've also allowed banks to be able to restructure loans in a way that normally would result in them having to treat it like a troubled debt restructuring or a non-performing loan. Uh, but we give them the flexibility now to um, alter a loan for as long as six months. And for ex an example of that could be that a bank has the option to consider whether they want to alter the terms of loans so that they defer payment of principal and or interest for up to six months. That loan would not be viewed as a distressed loan. And then the principal and interest that hadn't been paid during that six months could be tacked on to the back of the loan. So this is one of many ways that we've tried to encourage banks to be working with their customers. We've tried to reduce some of the regulatory oversight. We're not doing um, as many of the regulatory 
rollouts as we were doing prior to this becoming the uh, the pandemic becoming such a problem. So the purpose of these regulatory and supervisory changes are really to make it easier for banks to work with their customers to restructure loans. Those customers are going to be both businesses and individuals. Each bank has to look at each of these loans specifically themselves. So it's left up to the bank to make the decision. But the regulations have been uh, reduced to at least make it a little easier for the banks to work with their customers. Turning to slide 15. Uh, there are a number of other steps that have been taken, and I think it's really important to think about the role of Congress and the executive branch in trying to mitigate some of the problems from COVID-19. Types of activities that result in transfer payments be to individuals or transfer payments to corporations are not something that are natural for a central bank, but they are something that is the responsibility of the federal government. So fiscal policy is an essential tool to be used. Uh, fortunately, we had legislation passed in the last week that has a, a, a wide variety of uh, measures to try to help both individuals and firms get through this uh, crisis period. Uh, I think it's going to be important not only for those uh, things in the act to actually be fully implemented. Most, uh, many of the provisions are, uh, well, it's been legislated, they have not been fully um, implemented at this point. But I think it's really important that we be focused on making sure those programs work effectively. I think we're probably going to have to do more than what was just in the CARES Act, but I think it was a very good start at trying to mitigate some of the costs. Now, I would highlight that there are a lot of uh, aspects of the economy that are particularly troubling about this pandemic. And one of the primary concerns is that the pandemic has disproportionately affected hourly workers. So low and moderate income workers are probably going to bear more of the brunt of this than many other workers, in part because they're in industries that have been particularly distressed by the nature of the pandemic. So if you're in tourism, if you're doing hotels, if you're doing restaurants, if you count on uh, people coming into your store, all those kind of activities have been badly disrupted. They employ a lot of people and they tend to be hourly workers. So those are areas of the economy that have been very significantly uh, impacted. As we think of additional fiscal policies that may be needed, I would just highlight the importance of both simplicity and speed in order to make sure that we're in a position that as the public health aspects are mitigated, that we're able to get the full benefits on the economic side as well. Turning to slide 16. In terms of the economic outlook, social distancing is incredibly important to avoid overwhelming our medical facilities. Uh, that poses challenges for a wide variety of individuals and organizations. And so while it's critically important to make sure that the medical facilities are not overwhelmed, it is economically costly to do social distancing. Now, studies that have been done of the pandemic from a little over 100 years ago highlighted that communities that were putting in stringent regulations early on and carried them through for some time actually were the regions of the country that recovered most quickly from the previous pandemic. So it is important to impose these kind of restrictions uh, until we either have a vaccine or until we're able to widely test people so that we don't have community transmission. There's likely to be continuing challenges to get the economy fully up and running. So unfortunately, the social distancing, the sheltering at home is likely to result in a very significant increase in the unemployment rate. As many people are aware that are on this call, furloughs have already occurred in a wide range of industries. Some of the industries that I just mentioned are the ones that are most dram uh, dramatically affected. We saw a very significant increase in the number of people filing uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance last week. If you look at the details of that report, a uh, disproportionate amount of them were in California and Washington, which are places in the country that were uh, first affected by the COVID-19. They do not show the big increase that's occurred in places like New York, New Jersey, 
uh, Massachusetts, where it took another week or two before COVID-19 became a, as extensive a problem as it is now. So as a result, uh, I'm expecting initial claims to rise uh, fairly substantially over the course of the next couple of weeks. And I am expecting that the unemployment rate is going to rise pretty dramatically over the next couple of months. Our own internal forecast at the Boston Fed expects that the unemployment rate quite likely will rise above uh, 10%. Now, one of the challenges with making any of these forecasts is our forecasts really depend on data and having data that's relevant to the current period. The data that we really need right now is data from pandemics, and it's been a long time since the United States has had a serious pandemic. So any model that any economist comes up with now is quite tied to how successful we are in dealing with the public health aspects. So when we're trying to estimate how likely it is that we're gonna recover and what that recovery is gonna look like, a lot of that is tied to whether we think that we will be back in a situation where individuals feel comfortable taking the commuter rail, getting on the metro, getting on buses. That's gonna require the transmission not to be occurring That's going to require the ability of uh, individuals to feel comfortable going to work, going to restaurants, doing the things that we were doing before, and that probably is going to require much more testing of individuals and uh, much more effective um, social distancing to bring down the infection rate. So I would say that the economic recovery in this instance is primarily tied to the public health outcomes. But to the extent that the Federal Reserve can reduce the financial spillovers, both the um, severity of the recession that we're likely to have and the duration of the recession we're likely to have can be mitigated if we can avoid the most serious financial spillovers from occurring in addition to the problems that have already been uh, occurring from the public health slide. Turning to slide 17. Uh, so I'll just leave you with three closing observations. Um, this is a time where I think public service making a difference is incredibly important. And I think the role of the government, both the federal government, the central bank, and other governmental organizations becomes incredibly important at these kind of times. It's important in both big ways and small ways for us to think about how we can mitigate to the extent possible uh, the social distancing and make sure that uh, as we're doing that, that we're prepared so that when the economy does recover, we have the financial resources to actually do it. Uh, second, um, as I mentioned a couple of times, many vulnerable individuals are being disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So uh, individuals that are hourly workers frequently take mass transit, uh, hourly workers have been disproportionately laid off to the extent they're still working. They have to take mass transit, which exposes them to a higher likelihood of getting the disease. So I think this is a time that we have to be particularly considerate of those individuals that are more vulnerable at this time. I would also say that as we think about additional actions that the federal government and others need to take, Thinking about these vulnerable populations, thinking about the nonprofit side of the economy. So a lot of attention has been focused on the business community, and I think the business community obviously is critically important. But uh, we probably need more attention to the nonprofit side, which tends to provide a lot more of the services to low-income individuals. So we can't be forgetting the food pantries. We can't be forgetting uh, the homeless shelters. We can't be forgetting the various other services that are provided to low-income individuals that are being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And I'm hopeful that as we're thinking about other legislative remedies, that uh, future legislation really thinks hard about how we can mitigate uh, the effect of the pandemic on our most vulnerable populations. Slide 18, please. Uh, so my final observation is this is a time to be nimble and creative and proactive. Um, the central bank, I think, has been quite uh, proactive during this time. Uh, we both have cut interest rates very quickly. 
uh, but we've also started up some of these facilities. I would highlight the purpose of these facilities and the purpose of lowering interest rates is to help everybody. So it's not just helping businesses, it's not just helping a few. Uh, lower interest rates that transmit through the entire economy means that people can buy uh, cars, that people can buy, uh, buy things with their credit card at a lower cost. People are able to refinance their homes, which are frequently some of the biggest cost savings that they can achieve. Um, so the purpose of many of the actions that we're taking is trying to reduce the financial spillover and as a result, keep as many people employed as possible through this period. And when it's time for the public health issues to have abated, be able to make sure that we have as strong a recovery as possible. So I'll stop there, Jim, and take your questions. Right. Uh, thank you. Presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions that have uh, come in. Um, so let me start with you mentioned the mortgage market and refinancing activity. Uh, a couple of questions in that category. Uh, last week in the government's relief package, they provided protection for homeowners with federally backed mortgages who are unable to make the rent payments, allowing the opportunity to defer payments, add them back to their mortgage value. Um, so uh, I guess a two-part question uh, here. Uh, one, given your experience in this marketplace, um, there, was, there really wasn't relief for renters. Do you foresee any future assistance for renters, landlords, and so forth? And the second part of the question, um, how will the pandemic affect the housing market? Um, so, in terms of the renters, uh, many of them will benefit from the check. Many of the people that are renters are going to be uh, under the dollar amount that qualifies them for the check that's coming for the government. So that's going to provide uh, some help to renters. There's not currently a program that's directly focused at renters alone. So I do agree that that is an area that we'll have to continue to be looking at. Um, there are challenges for landlords, and I think that. Uh, some of them are going to qualify under the small business provisions of the legislation that occurred uh, previously um, last week. But I think there, uh, if you're a large landlord, most of those provisions are not going to apply. So I think that is going to be a challenge. I think in the near term, um, for both homes and for apartments, as well as office properties, we're likely to see uh, softening in prices, and in some markets, it may be a fairly significant softening over time. So I think this is the kind of shock that does unfortunately get transmitted to housing markets, to office properties in a significant way. And I think it's going to change some of the way people are thinking about doing things in the longer term. A perfect example is that a majority of the workers in my own organization are now working from home. When we come back, the question is going to be whether or not um, we need the same amount of office space as we thought we needed before um, because we found that work at home may be more effective than we previously anticipated. So I think there are going to be a lot of structural changes that occur as we pull out of this crisis. But in the near term, my biggest concern is that we don't get into a situation where a lot of homeowners get so far behind on their mortgage uh, that they become in danger of losing their house and that valuations start to soften, which means they don't have the same options for selling the house as opposed to being foreclosed on. So I think that's something to watch. Part of that depends on what the duration of this pandemic is, which is why it's so important that the social distancing actually works, that we start getting more ability to test so we can stop the community transmission and hopefully get to a point where people feel comfortable taking mass transit and getting back to work. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric, is it, is it possible to quantify how much the increase in credit spreads is due to market dislocation versus higher credit risk? Yeah, so a, no, so a number of the slides that I showed in this presentation were for the most credit worthy borrowers. In general, I wouldn't expect a lot of problems at the credit worthy borrowers. So I think most of that spread 
is reflecting liquidity concerns, the inability to transact in volume in those markets. But as you go to longer duration, and particularly as you get to more risky borrowers, uh, there, there is a liquidity problem. Those markets are not working particularly effectively. But in addition, I think part of the problem is not a liquidity concern, it's a credit risk concern. So one of the risks of having a low interest rate period for a long period of time is that you find individuals and firms take on more risks. And unfortunately, when you have a black swan event like this, those individuals and firms that are very levered uh, have much more difficulties in making sure that they can manage through the crisis. So uh, I think there are a lot of challenges going forward with particularly the more levered sector. But I think if you focus on the short term areas that I was focusing on, the treasury market, the uh, uh, mortgage market, some of the short term credit markets and the high quality corporate debt. I think a lot of the spreads that you're seeing that are starting to come in now uh, actually are reflect, reflecting liquidity rather than credit risk. And would you expect spreads to narrow to pre crisis levels? So I would expect for high quality credits that ideally in the next couple of weeks we'll start seeing those spreads narrow to being very similar to what they were pre-crisis. Uh, for the leverage uh, type of uh, lending, um, concern that if this uh, continues for some time and there's some persistence to how long it is that we have to be um, sheltered at home, that you are going to see more and more distress in those riskier types of deals, and those may not come down very quickly. Right. Um, let's see, we have a, another question. How can you have price discovery in the, in the Treasury paper and the MBS markets in the presence of massive Fed participation on one side of the market? So the reason we're getting involved is because there weren't very many buyers on the other side. So if there are no transactions, there's no price discovery. And part of the role of the Fed is to make these markets liquid again so that people can transact and so there can be price discovery. But what we have to do is equilibrate the supply and demand to a large degree so that we start seeing large volume of transactions. So they actually really reflect market prices rather than just a few distressed trades that occurred at fire sale prices. So our goal is to get that market more liquid. Once that market is liquid and functioning, we don't need to be as actively involved in those markets for that purpose. Great. Uh, question on GDP. Um, many economic models forecasting negative US GDP for the second and third quarters. Uh, do you have thoughts on the 2020 US GDP and beyond? So it's very likely that we're going to have two negative quarters. Um, and I do expect, as I said, the unemployment rate to get above 10%. So that's normally a recession level. 10% was uh, uh, the peak of the unemployment rate during the financial crisis. So it just highlights this is a very severe outcome. Um, I'm not sure it's that valuable to give long-term projections right now because so much of the economic outlook is tied to how successful we are at doing the social distancing in the near term, uh, being able to test people in, wide, in a much more widespread way so that we can be more confident that community transmission and individuals that are asymptomatic uh, are not going around and infecting other people. And eventually, I think the real solution, obviously, is going to be a vaccine, and that's still some time away. So I think the longer term projection is very much tied to how effective we are on the public health side. Right. Um, so we all know that the uh, IRS has postponed tax filing and payment dates. Um, and many states have followed suit with extensions um, that will require them to follow in the short term. Uh, what impact do you think that will have on municipal tax exempt bond market? So the municipal tax exempt market was already challenged, even ignoring the, the cash flow issues that 
um, municipalities and states are likely to be encountering. And I would say in many respects, their costs are going up as well. So um, I think that's going to be very challenging. And I think it's probably important that if there's more legislation that's done related to the pandemic, that uh, as well as focusing more on nonprofits, I think there needs to be more thought about transferring funds from the federal level to the state and local level. Um, it's going to be much more difficult at the state and local level, uh, in part because I run a budget. One of the issues coming out of the financial crisis was that even when the private sector started to hire, state and local governments had to do widespread layoffs because they were trying to balance their budget and then encountered so many costs during the financial crisis that they were cutting critical areas like police, firemen, teachers. Um, it would be, it's, I think it's very important for the recovery that we not relive that experience once again. And I think that's unfortunately going to require more federal legislation to provide transfers to state and local governments. Right. Um, question about the CRE market, which is a large part of the community and larger bank lending. Uh, how's this market being affected by the crisis and uh, what steps are the Fed taking or can can the Fed take uh, to help this market reduce credit stress in, in this loan segment? So none of the facilities we've done to date have been focused on the commercial real estate market. Um, that, very, uh, that market is critically important. It's also a market that um, people have been reaching for yields over the last couple of years as interest rates have gotten very low that's become an asset class that's particularly attractive. I would expect that the volatility that we're seeing is gonna make it very hard to do additional commercial real estate transactions. Uh, for the reasons that you were discussing with renters before, um, it is quite likely that uh, with businesses and individuals having trouble, that many of these commercial real estate projects are going to become um, more troubled than they were before. So I do expect that non-performing loans in the commercial real estate sector uh, will be rising at banks. Um, to the extent that this pandemic problem is relatively short duration, I think most organizations will be able to work through it. Um, if we don't get control of the pandemic, and this continues to go on for some time with the shelter at home, it becomes more and more costly and makes it more and more likely that the commercial real estate market will be further distressed. Um, Eric, um, the, this is a different kind of crisis. Um, we've had economic downturns before. Uh, uh, talk about how this one is different and maybe focusing on the 2008 crisis experience. Um, you know, what lessons were learned then that maybe the Federal Reserve is applying during this crisis, but also discuss how it's different. So the, the financial crisis by that very term was really focused on financial markets and banks. And so the nature of what needed to be done to mitigate that was primarily to get banks and financial markets back up and running. This is very different because it's a public health crisis. Uh, our banks came into this much better capitalized. Um, financial markets were in very good shape going through February, um, but this is a, a shock that uh, both the severity and duration of which are primarily being determined by things that are non-financial. Um, that being said, I do think that we've learned a lot at the Federal Reserve from the experience of the financial crisis. But during the financial crisis, it took us quite a long time to start setting up some of the facilities that are designed to prevent the financial spillovers. Um, we've been much uh, more adept because we had a playbook from the financial crisis of doing that. One way of thinking about these various facilities is normal monetary policy is reducing short-term interest rates. We're now at zero, so we don't have that tool available. These facilities are providing credit to individuals, to businesses, um, and so they're another type of stimulus that are more directed at individual categories. The reason we're able to do that is in part because we have the Treasury backstop, 
so we can leverage some of the treasury money to make sure that we're able to come up with programs that we hope don't take on very large losses but provide the credit needs to a much larger group of individuals and firms. So in the end, it has the same purpose as what we do when we do uh, regular short-term interest rate movements. Our desire is to make sure that we try to keep inflation near our target. We try to prevent the unemployment rate from getting very high. Now, since this is primarily not a financial shock, but a public health shock, the determinants of how high the unemployment rate gets and how long this crisis occurs depends on how successful we are to deal with some of the public health issues, how successful the fiscal policy is at providing transfers to those parts of the economy that are most affected. The role for the Federal Reserve is to really make sure that the financial spillovers don't aggravate what's already occurring in the real economy. So I think the nature of the two uh, crises are very, very different. I do think that the Federal Reserve played a very large role in mitigating some of the concerns that occurred in the financial crisis. And I think it's been very important that we've been actively involved in thinking about ways to mitigate the financial spillovers right now. So it's essential that individuals get the advantages from lower interest rates. It's essential that small businesses are able to be able to uh, get financing and do it at reasonable rates as well as for large uh, corporations. So. Um, we're playing the role of trying to mitigate some of these things, but in many respects, we're not as central as some of the other players are. So public health was not a big factor in the financial crisis. It's a very big factor. Mm, great. So, Eric, um, you mentioned uh, interest rates being at near zero and the two emergency meetings at which the Fed reduced interest rates. Um, taking you back in time, if I remember right, a couple of years ago when you presented at the chamber, you were talking about uh, the need to raise interest rates specifically because, um, you know, you would want to have, or the Fed would want to have tools in their tool toolbox in the event of a downturn or a recession. And if I recall, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, last year you opposed some of the Fed's rate cut decisions. Um, talk through those decisions uh, over time, including um, you know the recent uh, decision to cut rates last month. Sure. So as you highlighted, I was opposed to um, some of the actions that we took in the fall, but I've been very supportive of easing interest rates now. So why was I against? reducing interest rates in the fall, but for interest rates now. In the fall, um, I didn't think that it was affecting the overall economy to the degree that some of my colleagues did. And if you look back at both the unemployment rate, it was pretty stable at roughly three and a half percent. GDP grew through that period at roughly um, two percent. We were a little bit below our inflation goal. But I wanted to make sure that we preserved as much room as possible, that when a real significant negative shock occurred, that we had plenty of room to reduce rates. So when we got to this period, we only had uh, one and a half percent to be able to reduce rates. That meant that we didn't have quite as much room before we hit zero. And in fact, in two meetings, we hit zero. The second concern I had is when interest rates are very low for a long period of time, individuals and firms take more risk. And one of my concerns about why what is really a public health crisis is likely to become a more severe problem for the financial side of the economy is that some individuals and many leveraged firms are in a position where they're not going to be able to go without revenue for a period of months or possibly even quarters. So if the public health side means that we have to be sheltered in place for a longer time than currently anticipated, firms and individuals that took on a lot of debt are not gonna be well positioned to weather the storm through this. So I wanted to avoid that outcome, and I was concerned about the financial stability implications of encouraging too many people and firms to take on too much risk. And I think over the next several months, we're probably gonna start seeing evidence that those that became very levered experienced very significant losses, and that will make the downturn much more severe than it otherwise would have been. 
Thank you, Eric. Uh, turning, turning to Main Street, you've done a lot of work and research uh, focused on the ways financial stability issues impact the Main Street economy. How do you, how do you anticipate small businesses and the mom and pop businesses will fare through this, um, this pandemic? So I think it's a very difficult time for any small business. Um, I think it was appropriate that the CARES Act uh, really focused on providing financing to small businesses. That program is just being rolled out now, so it's way too premature to determine what the full impact. I'm hopeful that um, the federal government working through the Small Business Administration will be successful in providing very much needed financing to small businesses. I do think that even with the funds from the CARES Act, there's a risk that um, the public health issue lasts for longer than people are currently anticipating and an elevated unemployment rate occurs for longer than has been anticipated. And so I think it's gonna be a very challenging environment for small businesses, even with the support that's already occurred. I would not be surprised if there needs to be additional actions taken and so I think the, the small businesses should be contacting uh, wh whoever their banking relationship is and make sure that they're well informed about um, what the program is and what it can provide. But even with the support that I think that program provides, I think there will be ongoing challenges. So uh, it's not just small businesses that will have a lot of difficulties, but uh, I think they may be disproportionately impacted. Um, so it's uh, it's about 2:58. We have time for maybe one more question and then some closing remarks. Um, with the questions, of, I think Eric, we could go on for a long time. But um, you mentioned some of the sectors of the economy that that concern you uh, and that you're focused on. You mentioned low-income workers and industries like hospitality and tourism. <clears throat> As we look forward to sort of coming out of this, what indicators in the economy, what will you be looking at the signals that we're turning a corner or beginning to turn turn a corner? So I don't think we turn a corner till people feel comfortable taking mass transit again. And so <laughs> in some respect, <laughs> well, uh, the, the public health aspects make this very different, right? And so you have to feel, before you're gonna go to a restaurant, you wanna make sure that you're not gonna be come down with a very serious disease. And before you wanna take a plane, you wanna make sure that it's gonna be safe to be on that plane. And so we need to stop the community transmission, which is exactly what the social distancing is designed to do. And then we need enough tests that we know that asymptomatic people are not walking around so that we can get more comfortable doing the things that we were doing prior to the crisis. So. What I'm gonna actually be looking for more than economic turning point is gonna be public health turning points. At what point do people start feeling comfortable that they can go to work and be safe in doing that? So just a, a final comments. I think there are a lot of actions that are being taken. I think they're very necessary. I think it's really important that we spend time thinking about what some of those gaps are. I know I'm spending a lot of my time contacting people around New England to try to understand that. Uh, I'm talking to biz large businesses, small businesses, labor unions, uh, nonprofits, uh, to try to get a sense of what's happening in various communities and where those gaps are. I know uh, legislators are doing the same thing. They're trying to understand where the gaps are. And so uh, we need to be continuing to look at that and finding ways that we can fill as many of those gaps as possible. But also I would just uh, tip my hat in particular to those medical professionals that are putting their life on the line so that the rest of us can stay healthy. So uh, we need to remember not only the people in the medical fields, but also those people that just don't have the same safety in that that are much more vulnerable to both getting this disease and having to continue to work in hourly jobs that don't pay that well. So we need to think about ways to make sure that those individuals and organizations that support them uh, have enough support that we can mitigate for those groups as well. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, thank you for taking the time, sharing your thoughts.
Thanks for that today. Um, to those on the call, I'm sorry uh, I get, didn't get to all of your questions. Maybe we'll send them along to uh, to Eric and his staff, and we'll get you some answers to those questions. Uh, before we close, I want to highlight the Chamber's COVID-19 business resource page. There's a great deal of information uh, about all that's happening at federal, state, local uh, government levels. Um, we also have a couple of virtual programs coming up. On Friday, April 3rd at 10 a.m., we'll hear from three uh, PWC leaders uh, who will delve into strategies private companies um, should be thinking about and considering as it relates to COVID-19. And on Tuesday, April 7th at 2.30, we'll hear from Udit Batra, CEO of Millipore Sigma, who will discuss leading through a global crisis and incorporating his experience with the H1N1 pandemic. Um, you can uh, register for these programs and learn more about other activities of the Boston Chamber at bostonchamber.com. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you all for joining us on this call. That concludes our call. I'll be signing off. Thank you, Jim.